Let's look back at uh, verse number 8, if we would. The Bible reads, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured! But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now I wanted to focus on this, this passage uh, very greatly. And look at verse 10 where it says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. The title of my sermon tonight is Fully Known. What does it mean to be fully known? We see an interesting list here that Paul gives us. I think this list is a great list to know a great pastor a great preacher, a great evangelist. He's saying this is a list of things that you can tell who's a good pastor and who's not a good pastor. We, you know, I've, I've preached some sermons like testing the spirits and trying the spirits, the preaching against you know, the false prophets and ways to discern who they are. But I want to focus this sermon more on what it is to be a good pastor, what it is to be a righteous pastor, what it is to be fully known according to this passage. So the first point there was his doctrine. And you know, today, when it comes to First and Second Timothy, when it comes to these books of the Bible, churches today are terrified to read these entire passages. They would avoid these like the plague. Now, there might be a few verses in here that are really popular that they'll turn to, that they'll quote from. But they would be terrified to read every single excerpt of First Timothy, of Second Timothy. There's portions of that passage they don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. I'm talking about even Baptist churches, let alone the ones outside of the Baptist church. I mean, they would never read the King James Bible in First and Second Timothy. There's so many things condemning all the stuff that they do. And it says today, you know, the, the pastors, the evangelists, the Bible teachers today, they're afraid of people fully knowing who they are. They're afraid of people fully knowing what they believe. They're afraid of people actually knowing what it is that they think, what the Bible teaches, what they know. They're afraid of it. But in 1 Timothy 4, the Bible said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, and word, and conversation, and charity, and spirit, and faith, and purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. The point of a good pastor is to be an example. He's not to just hide who he is, hide what he knows, hide all the things that he's doing. No, he's supposed to be an example by teaching people what he knows, by showing them the truth, by being, by leading by example. They can know from his lifestyle all kinds of different things. So what is it that they're so afraid to tell people these days? I mean, Baptist churches even today, they're so afraid to admit that birth control is a sin. They're so afraid to get up from the pulpit and preach against birth control. Right. Preach against these sins. That, you know, birth control uh, causes silent abortions in many cases. If you look up just the, just the statistics on birth control, women are three times more likely to get cervical cancer if they take birth control. I mean, especially over a period of four or five years. I mean, they're just basically trying to poison their body without even knowing. They might as well call it the kill pill because it's killing babies in the womb, though. That's what the birth control does. It's not preventing pregnancy. It's preventing birth. By doing what? By hardening the, the lining of the uterus in a woman, causing it to where an implanted egg of seven or five days can't implant to the wall, and so it's flushed out and killed. That life that was, that was conceived in the womb is just flushed out by birth control. But you know, I, I went to a Baptist church where if you went on their website and you looked at their doctrinal statement, they said birth control is a sin, all forms of birth control are, are, are ungodly, we preach against it. But you know what? You never heard it in the pulpit. Right. And people in the pew are just filling themselves up with all kinds of birth control and all kinds of pills, but they won't get up and make people know what they know. They won't be fully known to the congregation. They're too afraid to just preach what they even believe. They'll admit they believe that, but they won't get up and preach it. They're too afraid. They're too afraid to let people know what they think about the homosexuals, about what they think about the sodomites. They're too afraid to preach what the Bible says. They're too afraid to preach what the Bible says about soul winning. I mean, I've talked to pastors. They never preach on soul winning. 
They never talk about it or say to do it or give any kind of exhortation. But you talk to us like, yeah, I mean, we should be going soul winning and the Bible commands it. And every time I read the Bible, I feel convicted that I should go out there and reach the lost. It's like, why aren't you preaching it? Right. They're afraid. They don't want to let people know what they know. They don't want to preach the Bible sometimes. They don't want to preach against the sinful lifestyle. They think that drugs are wrong. They think that watching you know, the TV and the smut is wrong. They think all these things are wrong. They don't do them. But you know what? They're afraid to let their example be shown. They're afraid of letting their light be shown. They don't want to be fully known. They're hiding. The Bible says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. I mean, the Bible makes it clear. If you do the right thing, aren't you going to be accepted? I mean, if you get up and you preach the Bible, the truth, aren't you going to be accepted? Well, maybe not by the sinful guy that gets offended and leaves, but won't you be accepted of God? Aren't we supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? Amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, go to Deuteronomy 32 if you would. Matthew chapter 10, this is Jesus. He said, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Jesus Christ wants the truth to go forth. He doesn't want it to be hid. He doesn't want you to hide it and not talk about it and not ever go over it. No, He wants the whole Bible to be preached. Isn't it so convenient that 2 Timothy says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, but they won't read the whole book to the congregation. They won't get up and preach all the things that First and 2 Timothy preach. Isn't that ironic? But they'll get up and quote it. They'll get up and say it, but then they won't preach it to the congregation. It's a joke. We look at the first point. He said, Thou hast fully known my doctrine. A good preacher, a good pastor, a good evangelist, you'll know his doctrine. He's not trying to hide what he believes. He's not trying to cover it up. He's not trying to slow roll you. And well, once they come to the church for a while, and once they come to the Mormon temple, and once they get married, and once they give us, you know, no, they're, they're going to give you all up front. They're going to say, hey, this is what we believe. Right on the door, right on, you know, the name of their church even. I mean, today there's so many churches, they're just named like the street and then church. Like we're just Bell Church. Bell Street Church. Oh, we're just, you know, 35th church. That doesn't even mean anything. When you think about the people in the Bible, the Bible says it would give a long list of names and it say they were expressed by their name. Meaning what? Meaning their name, what that, that name represented, was that type of person. It's who they were. Like Peter is a rock. Right. Your name means something. Jesus Christ's name means something. The names in the Bible mean something. Why is our church called Faithful Word Baptist Church? Because it means something. Right. We're not trying to hide what we believe or hide who we are. We're not just trying to say, oh, we're Bell Street Church. Oh, we're just this church over here on the corner. We're just the church over there. No, we're a Baptist church and Faithful Word comes straight from the Bible. We're teaching what we believe, what we're going to do. We're going to preach the Word faithfully. That's what we're going to do. Look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 1. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Now the Bible uses the word doctrine a lot of times. So the God right here is saying that his doctrine would drop as rain, meaning it's pleasant, meaning it's something to be desired, meaning it's something that's beneficial, something that's going to cause things to grow. And sometimes I think the word doctrine, uh, it confuses little people, confuses people what it means. But I think the best way to explain it is just what the dictionary says. The dictionary says a doctrine is a belief or set of beliefs held and taught by a church, political party, or another group. Basically, you could just use the word belief to get a good understanding of what a doctrine is. What is your doctrine on salvation? It's what you believe about salvation. What's your doctrine on the church? It's what you believe about the church. What is your doctrine on repentance? It's what you believe about repentance. That's what a doctrine is. So if someone's not giving you doctrine, they're not telling you what they believe. They're hiding it. They're not making it known. They're, they're covering it up. 2 Timothy 3, I already quoted this for you. Go to uh, go to second, uh, Revelation chapter 2, if you would. Go back to the end of your Bible, Revelation chapter 2. 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All the Bible is going to help you form the beliefs that you should have. Should form all the viewpoints that you have should come from the Bible. And we should use all of the Bible to form those beliefs. That's why we should go to the Bible to figure out, hey, what, is, what do I believe? I just believe what the Bible says. All Scripture. 2 Timothy 4 says, Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Preachers are supposed to preach doctrine. It's a command from God that the preacher would get up and preach doctrine. But you know, the people today, the pastors of today, the churches today, they, they're afraid to tell you what they believe. They're afraid to get really dogmatic. They're afraid to stand on anything. They're just real wishy-washy. They just want to tell people what they want to hear. You ask somebody, hey, I think money's the most important thing in the Bible. They're like, yep. Another guy says, well, I think baptism is the most important thing in the Bible. They're like, yep. Somebody goes and says, I think repentance is the most important thing in the Bible. They're like, yep. They'll just say yes to whatever you tell them. They're just trying to say whatever you want to hear. They're just, oh, what does everybody say? What does everybody say? Oh, I'm just going to say that. And that's why you hear all this double speak. You hear them sometimes contradict themselves. They're basically just saying everything, and then whatever sticks, they'll stick to. But only to, as the people stick to it. Because they change, he'll change with them. He'll just keep changing his doctrine just to kind of go along with whoever believes it the most. Whatever majority thinks. Whatever majority opinion is. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. We as a congregation, we should be hearing doctrine. We should want to hear doctrine. When you come to church, your expectation should be hearing what they believe about the Bible. What they know about the Bible. It says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, we don't want to take that out of context. I don't think he's necessarily talking about salvation to go to heaven there. I think he's just talking about salvation, destruction from the flesh, salvation from you know, all the sins that are keeping you in bondage. He's saying, look, if you continue in the doctrine, if you're teaching this to other people, you're going to save them not only from hell, but from all the sins in their life. You're going to save that unborn child from that wicked birth control. You're going to save people from ruining their lives with drugs and alcohol and perversion and filth. That's what you're going to do. You're going to save people if you continue in the doctrine. Why are all these churches filled with people who are living such lascivious, wicked lives? Because they're not preaching doctrine. That's why. They don't want to preach what they believe. They don't want to preach what the Bible says. Look at Revelation 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now the word doctrine, in and of itself, is not necessarily good or bad. It just means belief. So a belief can be good, a belief can be bad. We see in this example, there is a doctrine of Balaam, which was a bad doctrine. It was a false doctrine. It was... What it explained to us was sacrificing unto idols, was committing fornication. We see these are wicked things. So a doctrine just means a belief. And we should get all our beliefs from the Bible. Not from man, not from the church, not from traditions. Go to Proverbs chapter 5 if you would. Now when I was uh, going to a non-denominational church, we would try these things called life groups. It's where you'd, get to, you'd go to someone's house, and you'd all sit around, and you'd all open the Bible, and everybody has a psalm, and everybody has a doctrine, and everybody has an opinion. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Well, my version says this. And the leader, one of the leaders uh, that was at this time, he was like a pastor of pastors. So he was like one of the highest people in this church. I mean, talking about thousands of people in this church. This is a church that taught other pastors. This guy is like, you know, teaching hundreds of other pastors. I mean, this guy's high up. And it was, we were kind of, people were asking him questions about what he believed and kind of what his thoughts were on certain doctrines. And he said, look, I'll just be real straightforward with you, which is an oxymoron. He says, you can't tie me down on anything I believe. You know, you can't label me, you can't label me as like being, you know, a pre-tribber. You can't label me as being, you know, a Zionist. You can't label me these things. I'm real complex. I kind of just believe a lot of different things. He's being real vague. He's saying, look, you can't label me what I believe. You can't pin me down. You can't understand exactly where I'm coming from. That's a good sign of a false teacher. Someone that doesn't want to let you know what he really believes. He doesn't want to take a stand on what the Bible says. That's, that's fake. There's nothing wrong with the label easy believism. It helps people understand what we believe. I'm easy believism. 
All you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ. It's easy and you're saved. The Bible says, you know, people get really offended by this term replacement theology. There's a lot of people that throw a lot of mud at that term. They throw a lot of straw man arguments at that term. And they say, oh, you can't believe in replacement theology. I do. Label me. It helps you understand where I'm coming from. It's a doctrine that we can, you know, uh, get understanding. The label of Baptist. I'm not afraid to be called Baptist. You know, I grew up in a non-denominational church. It's garbage. It's fake. They don't want to be known by who they are. They're just vague. They don't want to really be fully known. They want to just kind of, you know, sand there, be in the shifting sands. You can't really tell what they're doing. Hey, what do you believe? Well, we're non-denominational. We just kind of make it up as we go. I mean, that should be that's their philosophy. You know, I'm not afraid to be called a Christian, a post-tripper, a fundamentalist. These are good labels. We should want to be labeled. We should want to be known what we believe. I'm not trying to hide it. I'm not afraid of those labels. I'm not afraid of somebody understanding that Baptist is the best denomination. It's a denomination that actually believes what the Bible says. They actually believe that baptism's after salvation. There's good things to be called the Baptist. Good labels to have. They called them Christians. What, trying to persecute them? Say, oh, you're trying to be like Christ. Yeah, that's right. I want to be like Christ. I'm not, but I'm trying to be. That's a good term. I want to be called a Christian. I don't want to be something, well, you're not really being Christian. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to lose that title. I don't want to lose that label. I want to be fully known. Look at Proverbs 5, verse 6. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. The Bible likens a whore as a someone that's movable. Someone that you can't know what they're really about. You can't pin them down. You can't figure out who they are. Why? That's what these false prophets are like. They're like whores. You can't figure out who they are. You can't figure out what they're doing. They just want to provide a service. You give them money, they'll give you what they want. They're just a whore. They get up and preach whatever you want to hear. Hey, what do you want to hear? Just as long as you tithe. Just as long as you're giving money in the offering plate. Just as long as you're filling the seat. You know, why would you call your Baptist church, why would you call your church at all, Bell Street Church? Why? Because they just want you to come and sit in the chair. That's it. That's, they want you to know where it's at just so you get in the chair. That's all they care about. They don't want to tell you what they believe. They just want to get you in there and get your money. That's why they label it this. Oh, we're, we're this, you know, tree church. Everybody knows Faith Lord Baptist Church. I don't have to tell them the address. They can look it up. They can find it if they want to hear it. But they know, hey, they're going to preach the Bible. Hey, they're Baptist. Hey, they're going to, they're going to believe the things that Baptists do. They're probably fundamental. Go to, what if, uh, what if we had named Faith Lord Baptist Church by a street? What if it was called Southern Baptist Church? Because it was on Southern Street. I mean, that would be really confusing, wouldn't it? I mean, you're like, well, we go to Southern Baptist Church. Oh, you're part of the SBC? No, we're independent. Why'd you call it Southern Baptist Church? Well, that's their street name. I mean, how stupid would that be? Go to Matthew chapter 23, if you would. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 21, My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. When you read the Bible and you get the truths of the Bible, you're not going to need to change. I'm not going to change on salvation. I'm not going to change on the nature of God. I'm not going to change on the King James Bible. I'm not going to change on the fundamentals of the faith. And we shouldn't meddle with those that are willing to change. And if I'm not going to change, why don't I just preach from the housetops? Why don't I put it on something called a doctrinal statement? Say, this is what I believe. Because it's not going to change. Because it's fundamental. Because it's just obvious. It's the truth. It's what the Bible teaches. But those that are afraid to put out a doctrinal statement. Those that are afraid to tell you what they believe, it's because they don't really believe anything. They're just a whore. They just want your money. And they'll just tell you whatever you want to hear. Matthew 23, we'll go to my second point. Second point in that list, he says, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, was the second point. Matthew 23, look at verse 3. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Go to verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. What does manner of life mean? It means your behavior. It means your lifestyle. It means how you act. 
We see that the Pharisees, they might have preached good things at times. They might have said the right things, but they say and do not. They're not actually living the life. They're not actually being the example. We see a good preacher, a good evangelist, he's not just going to say the right things, he's going to do the right things. He's going to follow what he preaches. He's going to practice what he preaches. We see a lot of times, uh, I, I see these guys, they'll get up and they'll preach on soul winning, they'll preach on certain things like that, and they don't go soul winning at all. They'll get up and they'll say, hey, we need to go reach the lost, we need to go talk to people, we need to give them the gospel. Hey, when did you do that? Uh... You know, like last year or two years ago. I mean, they say, but they do not. People will get up and preach the Bible, and then they'll just be a hypocrite at home. They'll be a hypocrite even in public. They'll be ripping on TVs and movies, but they'll go watch it at home. They'll go watch it in private. They'll go pull it up on their smartphone. They'll go be doing it. They'll just be a hypocrite. They'll rip on soul winning and never go out and touch, touch the soul winning. They'll preach on smoking and drinking and all these things while they're 400 pounds behind the pulpit. Won't preach on gluttony. Go to uh, 1 Timothy 3 if you want. I'll read for you verse 7. It says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The pastor is supposed to have a good report, lest he fall into reproach. It's a reproach when the pastor gets up and is preaching, and then he falls into what he's preaching. He's just a complete hypocrite. He's just a fraud. He's just a phony. That's why the Bible says they're supposed to live above approach. They're supposed to be blameless. The pastors aren't supposed to just be an obvious sin, and so they can't get up and preach against it. Because if I'm in just obvious sin as a pastor, I'm just not going to preach it. I mean, I don't want to get up and seem like a hypocrite. And that's what we see a lot of these pastors. They're probably in sin themselves. They're backslidden. That's why they don't want to preach the Bible. That's why they want to get up with boldness and make the word known. They don't want to be fully known because then it'll shed light on their darkness. It'll shed light on their sin. Matthew 5 says, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father which in heaven is perfect. We should try to be perfect. That's why it says a bishop must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on 1 Timothy chapter 3 except from Faith Lord Baptist Church. I've never heard it. They're never preaching on the qualifications of a bishop. And many times, if you get out, especially outside of a Baptist church, if you get outside of a Baptist church, none of these guys ever fit all the qualifications of a pastor. Never. I mean, they're always lacking in some area. I wonder why they don't preach on it. Why? Because they're just exposed that they're a fraud, that they're a phony, that their manner of life is not consistent with the Bible. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3.10. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. The deacons and the pastors are supposed to be blameless according to the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Also in Titus. But we see many times they're not. That's why they avoid these books like the plague. That's why they have to get a modern perversion that twists all the verses and says something different. Even if someone were to come up to them and ask them about it. Go to uh, chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2. So our manner of life should be, the manner of life should be consistent for a pastor. He should not only preach the doctrine, he should also follow the doctrine. He should be an example. The third point was in that list was a purpose. He says, you've known my purpose. What does that mean? Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. We see Paul knew some of his purposes. He says, look, I'm supposed to be a preacher. I'm supposed to be an apostle. I'm supposed to be a teacher of the Gentiles. Go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'll read for you from 1 Corinthians 2. This is what Paul said. For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What was his purpose? To go preach the gospel. To go get people saved. To evangelize the world. He said in 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He said, hey, my purpose isn't to baptize. He knew his purpose was to preach the gospel, to go out and fulfill the Great Commission, to be an evangelist. People sometimes, you, they don't, you don't know what their purpose is. Why are you being a pastor? Why are you being an evangelist? What is your purpose? What is the goal of your office? The office of a pastor is to feed the sheep, is to feed the flock. That's what he said unto Peter. Look at 2 Timothy 1 verse uh, 10. 
But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So what was Paul's purpose? He's telling them over and over, Hey, I'm a preacher. Hey, I'm an apostle. Hey, I'm a teacher. I'm not supposed to baptize, but I'm supposed to preach the gospel to you. That's my purpose. That's my mission. That's my goal. That's what I'm going to do. What's the goal of an evangelist? Is he supposed to go pastor? No, he's supposed to go out and preach the gospel. He's supposed to get those people saved. What's the purpose of a deacon? Is he supposed to lord over the people in the church? No, he's supposed to serve. The purpose of a deacon is to serve. What's the purpose of a pastor? It's to be the shepherd. To lead the flock. To guard over the flock. To warn against the wolves coming in. To preach the word. To be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. We ought to know the purpose of the offices that God gave us. And those people should know them too. And say, hey, this is my purpose. This is my point. This is why I'm here. This is what I'm supposed to do. He's supposed to be letting you know those things. Go to Isaiah chapter 1. If you like. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to His purpose. You know, not only should the pastors and the evangelists and all those people know their purpose, we should know our purpose too. What's the purpose of a saved believer? To go out and preach the gospel. It's not for us to be the pastor. It's not for us to be the, be the deacon and be all these things. No, we should just be faithful soul winners, faithful followers of the man of God, faithful stewards of the house of God, coming into church, supporting the man of God. That's what our role is. That's what our purpose is. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Don't be focused on all the stuff that you could be doing. Be focused on the purpose that God's given you. The purpose of your life. Maybe to be a husband. Maybe to be a wife. Maybe to be a brother. Maybe to be a child. Maybe to be a grandparent. It doesn't matter. Get your purpose from God's Word. And fill that, that, fulfill that purpose. Isaiah chapter 1, look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto you? saith the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand, to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. We could go on and on. They're just constantly doing those things that He commanded, but they don't have it right. They don't have the faith in the Lord. They're not doing the first works. We see that so many churches today, they don't understand their purpose is to be a light of the Gospel. To go out and preach the Gospel. They're doing all these works. They're doing all these things. And God's like, this is an abomination. All your stupid choir practices and your Sunday school and all these extra activities and all of your outreach programs and all of your get-togethers, I can't even withstand it because you're not preaching the gospel. You're not fulfilling your purpose. You're not fulfilling your first gospel. You're not fulfilling the first works. Preaching the gospel. John chapter 21, the Bible says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto them, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto them, Feed my lambs. Peter was being called out by God. He's saying, Look, you're not feeding the sheep. There is a lot of pastors today, they're not fulfilling their purpose of feeding the sheep. They have, the pastor should be fully known. It shouldn't be a mystery to figure out what he believes. It shouldn't be hard to know. Everything he believes from the Bible should be known. He should be preaching. Which makes me think of the word purpose. makes me think of this book called The Purpose Driven Church by a guy named Rick Warren. Now this guy is just one of the most wicked false prophets I, I can ever think of. And you know what I think about the false prophets of the Bible? He fits in perfect. Prophets like this. Eliphaz the Temanite. Bildad the Shuhite. Zophar the Ninethite. Elihu. These guys are coming up preaching false doctrine. And guess what? They're mixing a lot of truth with error. Now those guys might have been saved. I mean, you could interpret that a little bit differently. But these guys, when God comes up to Job, He says, what they spoke about me is wrong. They weren't speaking that which was right which Job had spoken. They were preaching false things. When you examine people like Balaam, who was definitely not saved, this guy was mixing a lot of good statements and truth in with lies. You would read certain statements. He's saying there's only one God. I'm only going to speak what he says. Those are true statements. Those are good things. When you see Satan uh, uh, come to Jesus in the wilderness, 
What does he do? He uses scripture. I mean, is there anything wrong with scripture? We know that every word of God is pure. But what is he doing? He's twisting it. He's perverting it. He's changing the context. He's not really preaching the word of God. He's tricking you. He's deceiving you by saying right things. By mixing truth with lies. By turning it into false deceits. That's what we see these false prophets of the day are. I don't think the, the most satanic false prophets are the ones that are just making the most outrageous statements. No, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. He's a deceiver. He's trying to trick you. So the God of this world has blinded the eyes or the minds of them which believe not. Satan's a deceiver. He's subtle. He's not trying to come in and just blow up the place. No, he's trying to get in there and trick you and deceive you. So I listened to uh, Rick Warren. He had this like 22-minute uh, gospel presentation or salvation message. So I'm listening to this thing. I think giving him the benefit of the doubt, I listened to the whole thing. You could say he tried to quote one verse. I mean, 22 minutes of video trying to tell you how to get saved, he maybe quoted one verse. Here's some statements that he said. Sin, well, the definition of sin is missing the mark. Now, I think that's false, that's wrong, that's a terrible way to describe sin. Missing the mark? I mean, what if I said I want to get 100 people saved today, and I got 99, so I missed the mark. Is that a sin? That's ridiculous. Missing the mark is not a sin. Sin is a transgression of the law. It's when you go against God's word, when you violate one of his commandments, that's a sin. And that's what the Bible says when we're sinners. We didn't just, oops, I accidentally didn't do perfect. Right. No, it's when you, tr you transgress God's commandment, when you make void his law, when you go against and despise him, rebellion, that's what a sin is. I, don't, I hate that stupid phrase, all oh, sin is missing the mark. That is not what the Bible teaches. He said God's not interested in religion. He wants a relationship. I mean, this guy is just every cliche. He says no matter what you've done, God is not mad at you. God is mad about you. I mean, he's just pulling from Joyce Meyer. I mean, he's saying, God, no matter what you've done, no matter how many children you've aborted and killed, and you're a sodomite, reprobite, you know, lying with beasts and murderer, oh, God's not mad at you. What a wicked God he believes in. My God's holy and righteous and the truth. He hates the wicked every single day. He hates all transgression. He can't even let one lie into heaven. That's my God. He said... You don't get uh, that better life by being religious. He keeps trying to introduce this idea of being saved is just a better life. He says, he confuses all kinds of things. This guy's definitely not saved. I mean, it's not even a question. It's not even maybe. He says that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he said it is finished, separating B.C. from A.D. I'm sorry, Rick Warren, that's not what separated B.C. from A.D. It's Jesus Christ's birth. Right. It's not when he died on the cross. He doesn't even understand that. He says Easter is when we separate B.C. from A.D. I mean, just, I don't even know why he believes that. Such a weird doctrine. He says, uh, he tries to quote John 1.12, a verse that a lot of people use out so many. I love this verse. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a little bit more before I get there. He says, how do you begin a relationship with Christ if you believe in him, you're halfway there. He says, by believing in Jesus, you're halfway to salvation. He says, 90% of Americans believe in Jesus. I'm like, where does he get that statistic? I mean, I go out so many, I definitely don't run into this 90%. I must be running into all the 10%, Rick Warren. But he says, no, the second half is you got to receive him. you got to believe in him, and you got to receive him. So he says, I'm going to quote John 1.12. He doesn't say that. He says, the Bible said, to those who he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe and receive. It was like an incoherent rambling. I tried to look it up. There's not even a modern Bible version that says that. I mean, the closest modern Bible version is the World English Bible. To those who he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe and receive. I mean, it, was just, it didn't even make any sense when he said it. He says, to, to quote it up, he says, you have to believe in him, you have to receive him. That's how you get across the bridge. He says there's a bridge to salvation. You've got to not only believe, you've got to receive. How do you do that? He says you, want, you have to want to change. You have to want to repent. Meaning you have to turn from meaninglessness to purpose. He always wants to inject that word purpose because that's all of his marketing material. Every book he writes has the word purpose in it. He says you've got to switch to Jesus' plan. You've got to turn from your self-centeredness and want to follow him. Meaning invite him into your heart. 
Now he's just preaching a thinly veiled word salvation. So then he gives a, a prayer for salvation at the end. This thing is so ridiculous. I mean, I couldn't even believe it. Here's his start to his prayer for salvation. He says, if, you, if you're done hearing me preach for 20 minutes, the most incoherent rambling of an idiot, then pray with me for salvation. Here's his start for a prayer for salvation. Dear God, I don't understand it all. What? That's how you start a, a prayer for salvation? Well, I don't understand it all, but I'm going to pray. Okay, here's the rest of his prayer. But I realize something is missing in my life, and I know that the good life isn't good enough. I want to live the better life. I don't need a religion, but I, need, I do need a relationship with you. So as much as I know how, Jesus Christ, I want to open my life to you and get to know you. I want to say yes to you. And then he just randomly bursts into this statement. He just says, I don't care if you're Catholic, Buddhist, Baptist, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim. We're not talking about religion here. We're talking about having a relationship. So I open myself to you and humbly ask you to forgive all my sins, the things I have done wrong. I ask you to come into my life and make yourself real to me. And I want to learn to love and trust you. And I want to live a life of purpose. I pray this in your name. Amen. Now, anybody that believes that he's saved is not saved themselves. Yeah. The Bible says that salvation is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, all three points he admitted from his stupid prayer that won't save anybody. He's trying to say, oh, I've got to want to live a better life, and I've got to want to follow his commandments, and I've got to want to commit my life to him. I guess it doesn't matter what religion you are. You can be a, you can be a Hindu and be saved according to him. Just have a relationship with Jesus. You don't even have to understand it. You just have to ask or be open or make yourself real to me. That just sounds like waiting for a demon to come and show you some kind of false doctrine. The Bible says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This guy's a deceived, idiot, loser. He's a false prophet. Don't tell me Rick Warren's saved. Don't tell me Rick Warren's a good pastor. Don't tell me Rick Warren's preaching the gospel. He's a false prophet. I've heard people say, he's the best pastor in America. He's the best prophet. I mean, he's, he, he boasts of himself of teaching 22,000 plus pastors. He says over the course of all of his seminars and all of the things he's had people come together, 22,000 plus pastors. He's corrupting and perverting this nation and preaching lies and preaching just what people want to hear. And you know, mixed throughout this whole stupid idiot video, he says things that are right. I mean, he'll say stuff like, well, we got to believe the Bible and God only respects what the Bible says. And you know, Jesus is God and Jesus is the Savior and Jesus is my God and I only believe what the Bible says and we need a Savior and we all deserve hell. Those are all right things. You can't judge a false prophet by the fact that he never says anything right. You'll never understand a false prophet. False prophets come to you with truth and lie mixed in and they teach you some kind of perverted, sick doctrine. Even if they were saved. Maybe the guys that were talking to Job were saved, but they got so mixed up they are preaching a bunch of lies. They made shipwreck the faith. They needed to be taught the Bible again. They were like babes in Christ. They were supposing that gain was godliness. If you understood what they were saying, they're constantly saying, hey, those that live good lives, those that live the better life, they're the ones that are saved. They're the ones that have a relationship with God. Those that don't, they're wicked. They're evil. Because God's obviously punishing the wicked. They're saying, Job, you must be in some wicked sin. Look at your lifestyle, buddy. That's what Rick Warren wants to say. He wants to say, oh, you're not living the better life. You must not be saved. You need to get a relationship with Jesus. Then you'll live the better life. What a false teaching, false prophet. That's not what God says. That's not what the Bible says. In 2 Timothy 4, the Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. We see he just wants to preach what he want to hear. He's just going to say all manner of things, and whatever sticks, he's going to stick to and say, I mean, he said all kinds of weird stuff like, I'm for, you know, gay marriage, I'm against gay marriage, I love the homos, no, I'm against the homos. I mean, he just says whatever, whatever the mood feels. And you know, it's, it's okay for a pastor to change his mind, but it's not okay for him to just say whatever he wants and just, you know, make it blanket statements that are contradictory. It's one thing to say, I used to believe this way, now I've changed my mind, this is what the Bible actually teaches, and to correct himself. That's biblical, that's right. 
We see Peter even made mistakes. Peter had to be corrected, right? Go to Proverbs chapter 3. So my third point is we should know our purpose. What is our purpose? Our purpose is to preach the gospel. The pastor's purpose is to preach the gospel, to feed the sheep, to be the shepherd over the people. We see, Rick Warren doesn't know his purpose. He's trying to go out there and evangelize and, and give all his false prophet you know, teachings to all these other pastors. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach for the pastor to go try and pastor a bunch of pastors. No, you're supposed to pastor the local church. You're supposed to raise up those people that don't know the Bible. You're not supposed to try and make yourself a pope. Make yourself a pope to all the world. And that's what he does. You read his book, it's from like Baptist, Methodist, and Catholic. They're all praising this stupid false prophet loser. Proverbs 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine understanding. and all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. And Paul's list of things, he said, man, are by purpose, faith. We see the man of God is going to have faith. He's going to do the things that the Bible says, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when people don't understand. He's going to say, hey, the Bible says we should go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Why don't we hold a soul winning marathon? You know, a few years ago, Faith Lord Baptist Church didn't hold soul winning marathons across this country. But our pastor, knowing the Bible, wanting to go out and fulfill the Great Commission, goes on a leap of faith, follows what the Bible says, and has soul winning marathons. And look what's taken off. We see the Gospels being pre preached across this whole nation, being preached across this world. Why? Because he had faith in God's Word. Not faith in himself. Not faith in his own ideas. Hey, maybe we should, you know, dress really cool. Maybe we should bring in cooler music. Maybe we should, you know, change the lighting. Maybe we should do all these things that man thinks of for a church. No, he's doing what God said to do for a church. What God said to do for the Bible. Go to uh, Luke chapter 9, if you will. The Bible says, Cry loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. We see a lot of pastors today, they're afraid to preach the word. They don't have faith that they can preach the whole counsel of God and God would build their church. They're too afraid of people leaving, getting up and walking out of the service, that they're too afraid to preach God's word. They don't have faith in his word. They're just too afraid to preach it. The Bible says that we should cry out and spare not. What does that mean? It means you know what you're going to say is going to offend somebody. You know that it's going to be attacking their sin. And you preach it anyways because it's the Word of God. You have faith in God's Word. Mark chapter 16 says, And He said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We should rely on God's methods for soul winning. God's methods for getting people saved. What does man want to do? He wants to have the altar call. He wants to get up and just preach at the church, preach at the saved, and try and get them to come down and rededicate their lives, not even understanding the gospel. You know, one of the churches I went to, they had multiple men stand in front of the altar every single service for five and ten minutes waiting for someone to come down and get saved. They never got saved, ever. But if they just walked across the street and knocked on the door of the person right across the street, they would have gotten saved. Hey, we're not supposed to wait to preach the gospel to someone. We're supposed to go to preach the gospel to someone. We're supposed to have faith in God's word. That's how you're going to get people saved. But man wants to do his own way. Look at Luke 9, verse 5. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. They were doing what God commanded them to do, having faith in His Word. That's the good, right, that's the good way to, to preach the gospel. And even when they won't receive you, just shake off the dust and move on. They're not going to come to you. Many of the people that you go to won't even want to listen. We've got to do it God's way. Go to 1 Corinthians uh, 1, if you would. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. The good faith, having soul winning marathons, having missions trips, the right way, according to God's Word. Not going to build a house, going to build God's house by preaching the Gospel. Not, not, not supporting all the missionaries. They want to get everybody all stirred up and say, Reach deep into your pockets. Give $500. Give $1,000. Give $10,000 to this moochinary who might get one person saved. Maybe from their parents who got them saved. Not from the actual missionary. Not from the missionary going out and preaching the gospel. They want to have the building fund. They want to get you to have faith in their building fund. 
God's going to provide us a building. I believe it. I'm trusting in this street over here, in this building. God's going to deliver this building to us. We need to pray and have faith. Why do we pray for people to get saved? Why do we pray for more men to stand up to want to go out and start churches? Why do we pray for more missionaries, actual real missionaries that want to go out and preach the gospel? There's a dearth in the land of missionaries. Why don't we have faith for that instead of this stupid stuff? 1 Corinthians 1, the Bible says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ Jesus, that in everything you're enriched in Him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Now when you're moving into the latter points of what Paul was saying, he said, you know, manner of life, purpose, faith. Then he says long-suffering. Now he says charity and patience. All three of these words are very similar in their meaning. But I think there's a little bit of subtle difference that we can pick up. What does it mean to be long-suffering? I think if you just break that word apart, we see suffering, which means what? Tolerating something that you don't like or you think that's wrong. What does long mean? Being doing it for a very long time. So the difference to me between patience and long-suffering is patience is just uh, giving people time, giving people, you know, enduring with them. Long-suffering is more focusing on the fact that it's actually suffering or it's something that is causing, you know, some kind of uh, uh, some discomfort or something you don't think is right, something that you're allowing to exist just for a time. You don't have to necessarily be patient with someone just because they're doing something wrong. You know, a lot of times I'm patient with my children. doesn't mean they're doing something wrong, but to be long-suffering would be, hey, they are doing something wrong, but I'm still being patient with them. We see it's, it's an increased level of patience. And with the Corinthian church, Paul was long-suffering with them. They were getting a lot of things wrong in 1 Corinthians. They were getting a lot of things wrong in this church, but he's long-suffering with them. What? He's putting up with all their grievances. He's trying to, you know, still teach them the Word of God. He's still trying to be a, a, a blessing unto them. He's still trying to teach them. He wants to go and visit them, even though he knows they're doing things wrong, even though he knows he's, he's, they're screwing up. Think about people that get saved and live a very sinful and wicked life, and they come into the church. Maybe they've still got some things wrong. It's long-suffering for the pastor to put up with those grievances, to try and teach them the Bible, to try and guide them in the right way, to try and get them over that hump, being patient with their, their, their uh, ignorance of the Bible in many cases. I mean, many times people uh, that have their heart right, they're sitting just through ignorance. Go to uh, chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. We see he also said charity. Charity is putting others above yourself. It's, tr it's training others. It's teaching others. It's trying to lift others up. What should the pastor be doing? He's trying to train and, and pour his life and his soul into other people. In 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22 it says, So the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. That's long-suffering. That's charity. Deciding, hey... I'm just going to be weak with this guy. I'm going to be weak with this brother. He might have a, be ignorant of a lot of things in the Bible, but I'm just going to be weak with him. I'm going to help train him. I'm going to help teach him the Bible. That's a good pastor. Not one that's holier than thou, that's going to cast them aside, or, you know, just go grab a beer with them and not actually really help them, not actually teach them the Word. Go and live sinful lives with them. Say, hey, it's okay to drink. Hey, it's okay to watch rated R movies. Hey, it's okay to do all these wicked sins, live in fornication. It's not a big deal. We live in a grace, buddy. That's not, that's not long-suffering and charity because you don't really care about the person. You're going to let them get destroyed by the sin in their life. We see the person that's long-suffering and has charity. He's going to, with patience, endure their grievances and teach them the Bible. He's going to be long-suffering towards them. He's not going to just cast them aside, and he's also not going to just allow them to live in their wicked life but it will be very long-suffering to them. Go to uh, John chapter 7. I'm trying to hurry through these notes. It says in Philippians 2, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. The pastor is putting the flock before his own ambitions, before his own desires, before his own comforts. He's sacrificing himself for the flock. He's giving his life for the flock. He's, he's doing all kinds of things for other people. He's esteeming them better. He's trying to pour into them. That's a good pastor. That's a good preacher. That's a good evangelist. He's not worried about getting all this vain glory and recognition and having, oh, I trained 22,000 pastors. No, he wants to send out the next generation. He wants, he's, he's focused on the people in the pew, not the people outside the pew. We see that he's also patient. What does that mean? 
Kind of the same things. Training people, growing in the Lord, new believers. Growing the church God's way, not Rick Warren's way. Being patient by following God's commandment, knowing that God will build the church. Saying, I don't need a gimmick. I don't need to just, you know, test the waters and see what everybody likes and try to just fill the church. I don't need to name my church the street just to make sure people know where I'm at to try and come in. John chapter 7, verse 6, it says, Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. One thing I think about a good pastor, a good preacher, he doesn't go out to start a church when he's not ready. Meaning what? He hasn't met the qualifications of a pastor. He's not Ashton Yacton trying to go out and just start his own church in his house and say, well, I just forsake 1 Timothy chapter 3. I don't care what it says. I bet he'd be real nervous to get up and preach 1 Timothy 3 from the Bible. Why? Because he doesn't fulfill the qualifications of a bishop. But he's pretending to be a bishop. He's pretending to be sent by God. He's pretending to have a church. You know, is he the, the man of God? He's going to be patient. He's going to know, hey, the office of a bishop, the office of a, office of a deacon, the office of an evangelist. I'm going to be patient and wait until I can do that office. I'm going to follow God's Word. I'm going to esteem God's Word more important than me. We see even Paul. Paul didn't just immediately become an evangelist and apostle. No, he was at the church. And then when the church laid hands on him, he went out with Barnabas to go out and be an evangelist. Why? He was patient to know the Word of God. He was patient to fulfill what he needed to do, to learn, to grow. To be ready according to God's word. He wasn't going to go out his own wisdom. He was going to have the patience to wait and do it by God's way. Do it God's doing it God's way is always going to get the job done. We see a lot of times people even in battles, they had to be patient. They couldn't just rush into the battle. They had to do what God said. Wait until you hear the you know the noise in the mulberry trees. Wait until you go around Jericho seven times. What if they had just rushed into Jericho? They would have failed. But when they were patient. And they did it God's way. They got the victory. Without any effort. I mean, God did the fighting for them, right? That's what we need to do. We need to be, good pastors are going to be patient. They're going to wait on the Lord. I'm not saying they should be slow to preach the gospel. They shouldn't have zeal. They shouldn't be excited. I'm just saying they're going to follow what God said more than their own you know, desires. They're going to let their desires be lined up with God's word. They're going to have patience according to God's word. We see in... Uh, the last part, he said that there was persecutions and afflictions. Go to Acts chapter 13. It's really interesting what he had said. He said, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. Now it's interesting what Paul went through in these cities. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga of Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Sidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Skip down to just verse 50 for time's sake. So we see he went to Antioch. And then Paul preaches this really long sermon. He preaches against them. He's rebuking them. And in verse 50 it says, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women, and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came to Iconium. So they're doing what Christ said. They're just shaking off the dust of their feet and moving on. Now they're going to Iconium. So they've been kicked out of this city. But then it gets worse. Look at uh, chapter 14. Look at verse 2. So they're in Iconium. And it says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Look at verse 5. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, then they were aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe. So not only are they getting kicked out, now they're being threatened to be killed. They're being threatened to be stoned. They're like, we're going to abuse you, we're going to kill you, we're going to do things, and they flee. But then look at verse 19. Now they've gone to uh, Lystra. And there came thither Jews from Antioch and Iconium, so now they're getting followed, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So first he's kicked out of the city. Then he's threatened. Then he's stoned to death. I mean, he's stoned to sleep. But they think he's dead. They just think that he's been killed, but he really hadn't. I mean, what kind of persecutions and afflictions? We see when you preach the Word of God, when you're a faithful witness, when you're fully known, people are going to get upset. People are going to want to kill you even. We see that the man of God has enemies. 
We see these false prophets, these false teachers, they don't have any enemies. The whole world loves them. The whole world wants to put them on his pedestal. The world wants to give them all kinds of accolades. But what does the world want to do to the real man of God? He wants to stone him. He wants to shut him up. He wants to chase him out of the city. He wants to threaten him. He even is going to try and kill him in many ways. We see that they had fully known who Paul was. They knew through all of his you know, doctrine, from his manner of life, his purpose, his faith, his charity, his patience, his persecutions, afflictions. We know that he's a man of God through all these things. How can you know the man of God? You can know him through this list. It says even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. You can be known by how you live your life. You can be known by your actions. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We need to understand what we believe who we believed it from. What doctrine am I being taught from who? We need to see, hey, this guy lines up with what 2 Timothy 3 said. He's got, a, he's got a good purpose. He's teaching me doctrine. He's living the life. He has the faith. He's even being persecuted for the Word of God. This is the guy that I want to believe what he's believing because I know whom I believed it. He's the one that's teaching me. And I'm going to stick to it because he's following what the Bible says. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your Word. Thank you that there's pastors still in this world that can be fully known. I pray that we would always search the Scriptures and that we would test the pastors and we try to find those that are faithful to your Word to follow and to respect and to lift up and to uh, continue doing good works with them and to believe the things that they teach us and we can be assured of those things knowing of whom we've learned them. I just thank you so much for this church and everyone in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.